Like many people, as I entered middle age, I longed to put a convertible in the driveway. And today I'm happy to say I've done just that. And while it may not have fancy rims or a shiny paint job, it's definitely a classic all the same. So let's get this beauty parked inside and talk about what she's got under the hood. The 5140 is powered by the venerable Intel 8080 processor clocked at a whopping 4.77 MHz. It was paired with 256 kilobytes of memory in the base model, with mine containing 512 total, and the convertible maxing out at 640. For storage, the convertible boasts dual dual-side double-density floppy drives, each holding 720 kilobytes of data. Other than that, there's no internal storage, so you really are stuck with floppy disks. Below that, we have an absolutely beautiful, if not completely standard, mechanical keyboard, powered by a combination of ALPS Brown and ALPS Compact switches. I don't love the typing experience as much on this as I do on my IBM Model M, but it's still the nicest typing laptop experience I think I've ever had. There's just something about the travel and steady clack of these keys that's almost therapeutic. And of course, what good is a laptop without a display, and this machine certainly has one. The black and white LCD on this machine is a widescreen affair, running a maximum resolution of 640x200. Even odder than the screen's layout is its lack of backlight, which made lighting the screen for viewability during this review particularly troublesome. I settled on using these two USB-powered LED panels on either side, which gave a relatively decent view, which, believe it or not, actually looks better on camera than it does in person. Future releases of the 5140 actually included a backlit screen, but it cut the battery life well below half, so you had to pick your trade-off. Unfortunately, it looks like the adhesive that holds the polarizer to the screen is starting to let go, giving it some cosmetic blemishes around the edges. But if that's the only thing that's begun to let go after 36 years, I'd say this machine's aging great. If you're wondering where they got the name IBM PC Convertible, look no further than the display itself. In an interesting play on the machine that can go from being a portable to a desktop, pressing the lever underneath the screen releases it so it can be detached, leaving you clear to place a color monitor above it and use as a desktop. Neat. This really is IBM's first kind of true laptop, both in form factor and function. The unit featured a NICAD battery pack which, thanks to its lack of spinning disk and backlight, was good for a reported 10 hours of use. And the battery pack on this unit was rebuilt at some point before I got it, and it's fully functional. And it was also the first portable to feature actual power management. In fact, the laptop doesn't actually turn off when you press the power button. Instead, it goes to sleep. The CPU is paused and the memory remains powered so that when you tap the power button again, it brings you right back to where you left off. And when it was time to take the 5140 on the go, all you needed to do was lock the lid and slide out the integrated handle and you were ready to bring it just about anywhere. So how much did this portableness cost you at launch? Well, the convertible was launched at a price of $1,995 US or a little over $5,000 by today's standards. I picked up this unit along with a portable data terminal, untested and without a power supply for just $125 Canadian for the pair. And I had very little confidence that it would actually work, but I figured for the price, it was worth it even as a display piece. But after digging out a 15 volt power adapter and shaving some plastic off so it would fit into the deeply recessed power jack, I was pleasantly surprised to find out that it works flawlessly. And other than a bit of surface scuffing and a bit of dirt, it's in remarkably good shape. Now, before we get into what it can do, I'd like to talk about what it can't. Specifically, as stock, it can't connect to any external devices. That's right. You'll notice as we move around the outside of the unit, the only ports on it are the power jack and an RJ11 jack for the integrated 300 baud modem and that's it. No serial, no parallel, no external disconnections, and that's because, well, the convertible didn't include any of that. Instead, external connectivity was added by connecting snap-on modules to the rear of the unit via this proprietary interface. 
This included a parallel serial module, an external monitor module, and even a printer module. Yep, an entire printer could bolt right onto the back of this thing. And while I find the idea of all these modules intriguing, I think it really hurts the unit to not have at least a serial and parallel port integrated. The inability to connect an external printer or a mouse without an add-on device that increases the entire overall size of the machine is just unfortunate. We joke about Apple having dongles for days, but IBM was doing it before it was cool. Really, at the time of release, portable computers were nothing new and almost always included additional ports. Check out this Morrow Pivot 2 Luggable which was released just a few years earlier. With some similar specs, it also included a parallel and serial port for external connections as well as an integrated modem. I don't own any of the modules myself, but Cathode Ray Dune I just happened to be working on our videos for the 5140 at the same time, and he covers them in great depth. So if you want to know more, check him out by clicking on the link below. He does awesome content and if you're watching this, chances are he's right up your alley. One of the cooler aspects of the convertible is the engineering that went into the opening mechanism. While modern day laptops simply have a screen that hinges open and closed over a stationary keyboard, the 5140 adds a little more style and flair. But before we get to that, we need to talk about the latching mechanism. Considering the engineering that goes into some of the stuff you'll see later, it's definitely a weak spot. These two little buttons placed underneath the carrying handle are the release mechanism. And the screen isn't spring-loaded, so when you press the buttons, you also have to awkwardly place your hands on the screen and lift it up. The buttons for release are also comically small. This being the first 5140 I ever saw in person, I wondered if perhaps parts were missing and these nubs were what was left of the original release buttons, but nope, they all look like this. As the screen hinges open, the two floppy drives are raised to give an easier to access position to the user, as well as placing the keyboard at a much more satisfying typing angle. I must have opened and closed this machine a dozen times just to watch it in action. It's a small detail, but it's very satisfying. Now that we've seen what the hardware has to offer, let's see what it can do. And we'll get right to that right after this commercial message. Taking your business on the road can be a cumbersome task. And productivity can easily fall off. Presenting the IBM PC Convertible, a powerful personal computer that easily converts to a full function portable. One you can use in a train, a plane, a car, or a meeting productive on the road as you are at the office. The IBM PC Convertible. One computer for people who really need two. It apparently originally came paired with a copy of IBM PC DOS with a proprietary interface, but after digging around online, I was only able to find one disk of the setup software. So for now, we'll be sticking with MS-DOS version 3.3, which runs quite happily on this machine. We're a little limited on what we can do for a GUI without a hard drive, but something I've wanted to try was a copy of Windows 2 on it. Specifically, we'll be running Windows version 2.03 from 1987, which thankfully can just be run off a couple of floppy disks. So, after configuring the installation for the machine and shuffling through some floppies, I can confirm that Windows does indeed run. We are, of course, stuck with just two colors, but even then, everything is perfectly legible. This is one of those spots where we run into the limitation caused by the lack of expansion. While you can certainly maneuver your way around with the keyboard, this would go so much better if I could just connect a serial mouse and point and click my way through it. Even in the early days of Windows, we can see many apps and features that live on to this day. Of course, we have a calculator program. After all, if you've got this sophisticated device with you, you're not going to want to pull out your pocket calculator and miss a chance to show it off. And to make use of that lovely mechanical keyboard, Windows 2.0 includes the write application, which would eventually become WordPad in later versions of Windows. Provided you had a passable amount of light, writing a novel or documentation on this machine would be absolutely fine. I even tried swapping to a more traditional black text on light background, and that worked great too. I kind of wonder what kind of looks I would get if I brought this thing into a Starbucks and started working on it. After all, with 10 hours of battery life, it's kind of tempting. There's also an analog clock application for all your time-telling needs, as well as a calendar app. But when it comes to Windows gaming, we're a little light. It includes a copy of the game Reversi, which, sadly, didn't make it to later versions of Windows. But if you've got a hankering for some Reversi, the convertible's got you covered. 
This was the final version of Windows that was able to run exclusively off floppies, and with the speed of it, I'm not shocked. Still, running a somewhat visual GUI on this thing is still kind of amazing, and it was totally worth playing with. Moving on to DOS productivity software, WordPerfect runs absolutely fine. I'll be the first to admit that my knowledge of early WordPerfect hotkeys is pretty abysmal, so I didn't really do anything here that was going to be taxing. But if you needed it on the go, it was right there for you. I got my early start on software development in QBasic many years ago, so I'm always looking for an excuse to jump back in. I didn't try anything too complicated, but this system was more than capable of running some basic code. Literally. Of course, this type of machine wasn't designed to play games, but that doesn't mean we aren't going to try. And first up is Alley Cat, published, fittingly enough, by IBM themselves. This is a CGA game that always looked a bit gnarly to me color-wise. Unfortunately, without the extra colors to differentiate all the items in the game, it's a pretty lackluster experience. Not unplayable by any standards, but I think we can do better. Next, I checked out the classic arcade game Burger Time. This has always been one of my favorites, and I'm pretty sure that there's at least one or two people watching this that feel the same way. While it's definitely not the prettiest on the integrated LCD, it's still definitely more playable than Alley Cat was. It kind of feels to me like I'm playing on an old Tiger handheld at this point. It's something about the way things look on this LCD. I'm not exactly sure what it is, but yeah, it kind of works for me. Not only that, but the sound effects in this game are amazing over the integrated PC speaker. This is definitely one of those games where they seem to try and capture the overall feel of the audio from the arcade game, and it's really worth trying. Then I moved on to the Sega Classic Zaxxon. It took me a little bit to get used to how things looked on this display, and I did feel that the small amount of ghosting the screen provides made some obstacles quite difficult to avoid. It's still kind of amazing that it worked this well, though. Avoid the Noid is a game that was released as a promotional item by Domino's Pizza back in 1989, and is a game I spent so much time playing as a kid that I just had to include it here. The load times were exceptionally long, but the gameplay is pretty decent. The music and sound effects are exactly the way I remember them, save for a couple of examples. This game featured some recorded PCM audio that played just a little slower than normal. Other than that, it was good time spent with an old friend. And finally, probably the most complex game I got running on here was Jill of the Jungle. I unfortunately had to cut out a lot of the extra files to strip it down to fit onto a 720 kilobyte disc, so I wouldn't recommend trying to play past the first few stages. And Jill really pushes the resources on the 5140 to their limits, never quite hitting full speed. In a way, it kind of felt like cheating. With everything running in slow motion, it became a lot easier to time jumps and avoid enemies. Still kind of fun, but this is not the way. There were a number of games I tried to play on here that just wouldn't work for various reasons. Galaxian wouldn't recognize keyboard inputs, and I suspect that it's because the game might have been written for a PC with a different type of keyboard layout. The story was the same with Pac-Man, or should I say PC-Man. The game itself runs, but pac er. PC man doesn't respond to the cursor keys. So how does the IBM PC convertible finish? Well, we've been through the pluses and minuses of the machine, but we haven't spoken about its fatal flaw. By the time the 5140 hit the market, it was already up against cheaper machines that often sported nearly half the price, a 286 processor, a backlight display, and an internal storage, and sometimes all four. As a result, it pulled little market share and faded away, leaving room for much more successful IBM laptops that were to follow. That being said, I am thrilled to have this beauty in my collection. The design and engineering that went into it created a device that's pretty boring when it's closed, but rather pleasing when it's open, and I've had it on prominent display since I got it. It may not be a convertible that crosses the finish line first, but there's nothing wrong with enjoying the ride. Hey, thanks for joining me on this journey, and thanks to my Patreon supporters who help make videos like this one possible. If Retro Attack is your thing, I invite you to subscribe and stick around for more fun. That's it for this one, but I'll see you again soon.